Today on Tara Marie Live, we talk about everything you need to know about prostate cancer, including a treatment that is a game changer. CyberKnife is a non-invasive treatment that boasts a 95% long-term disease-free survival rate. One in nine men in the United States will get prostate cancer in his lifetime, and it's the second leading cause of cancer death among men in the U.S. My guest is Dr. Jonathan Haas, chairman of the Department of Radiation Oncology at NYU Winthrop Hospital. He's a pioneer in CyberKnife and has performed more CyberKnife treatments for prostate cancer than any physician in the U.S. CyberKnife provides hope to thousands of people with tumors once considered inoperable. I'm Tara Marie, and I'm a fitness expert, personal trainer, and motivational strategist. Optimal health is achieved when you're balanced mentally, emotionally, physically, socially, and spiritually. My goal is to bring you information that will help you be the best version of you. Hello and welcome to Tara Marie Live. I'm here today with Dr. Jonathan Haas. He's the chairman of the Department of Radiation Oncology at NYU Winthrop Hospital and a pioneer in CyberKnife. Dr. Haas, welcome. Thank you so much for having me on today. We are so happy to have you. I was telling you before we, we started rolling that I've been wanting to do this interview for literally a year. Well, when I was invited, I was excited yeah. here for the last couple of weeks. I'm glad we were finally able to connect and do e this. Exactly. Now, just last week, Rich and I, my, my director and I, we went out to the Manhattan Cyber Knife mm -hmm. facility, which is blocks from where I live. Right. And it was beautiful. It Thank was a you. gorgeous facility. Thank you. Yeah, we put a lot of thought into that. So, you know, the, the main facility, which we can chat about, mm -hmm. is at NYU Winthrop Hospital mm -hmm. in Mineola on Long Island. Um, and we've been doing CyberKnife since 2005. And okay. we were kind of stunned. What I consider to be the greatest city in the world, Manhattan or New York, didn't have a CyberKnife. So we put a lot of thought, a lot of research into placing a CyberKnife in Manhattan. You know, we spent years trying to find the ideal site. Mm -hmm. um, and we really were putting a lot of thought into how it should look because we didn't want it to be sterile. We didn't want it to yeah. be a hospital. Um, patients are already kind of freaked out enough when they get a diagnosis of cancer. So why can't we do something to make it a pleasant, warm, inviting space? So it's And, and you've seen it, and thank you for the compliments, yeah. but it's very bright. It's very open. We try to keep it warm. It looks like you know, a living room. It yeah. Looks, yeah. You know, it's, it's, every, it's my favorite day of yeah. the week to come here. And then uh, you, you met my partner, Dr. Blacksburg. Yeah. Um, Dr. Seth Blacksburg. He's wonderful. Yeah. So, you know, he's been with us for about six years now, and we recruited him specifically to kind of helm that practice, and he's really done a fantastic job building it. And, and I want to say this. So, so you've got, so should you call it almost like a satellite facility, That's right. the CyberKnife NYC right. in Manhattan. And then again, the second, the, the larger NYU Winthrop Hospital is Correct. in Mineola, Long Correct. Island. And I want to say that I understand that NYU Winthrop is the number one facility in the country That's right. and in the top five in the world for CyberKnife treatments for prostate cancer. Right, that... actually for, for everything. So, uh, so mm -hmm. we started our program in 2005. Um, we are the largest CyberKnife prostate practice mm -hmm. and the largest CyberKnife knife practice in the country. Um, we are one of the largest sites in the world. Um, there may be one or two sites in China, which may be a little bit busier than we are. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a treatment that we believe in. It's technology, which we can chat about, which we think is unsurpassed. Um, and it's a fantastic treatment. If I can get my patients back to their lives and their family in five days, as opposed to nine weeks with equivalent or better outcomes, it's, yeah. it's a no-brainer. Exactly. And and again, we were we were so impressed with the facility. It was just it was so beautiful. And I wanna be clear with everybody because if, if you Google CyberKnife, it can be confusing. Um, you know, CyberKnife is available around the country, right. in different areas around the country right. and of course around the world. Absolutely. But you Dr. Jonathan Haas, you're a pioneer in using CyberKnife. You've done over 5,000 CyberKnife treatments for prostate cancer. That's right. more than any physician in the United States. And you're the doctor who trains other doctors. Right. So, uh, you know, we travel a lot. We really take pride in what we're doing. Um, Astro which is our biggest meeting of the year mm -hmm. for the Society of Radiation Oncology, was in San Antonio um, this past year. And they asked us to host a training course on what's called SBRT, or Stereotactic Body Radiation Therapy, which is what we consider cyber enough to be the pinnacle of. Um, and we had uh, physicians, you know, some of the finest academic physicians from all over the country and all over the world, and we oversold the room. Um, and it was yeah. a satellite symposium, and we're working on other courses now. Um, you know, I'm on the plane a lot. Um, I was in mm -hmm. San Francisco uh, for like 14 hours two two weeks ago, literally like overnight to give a talk. Um, I've been to and, – and the nice thing, it's really f for me, 
selfishly given me a chance to see the world. Um, I was invited graciously to speak in Hong Kong a couple of years ago. I've mm -hmm. been in Thailand. I've been in Japan. Um, we have hosted patients from all over the world. I had a really neat guy um, that came about a month ago from South Africa, and he's a wildlife photographer. His full-time job. Oh, it was a patient he came. Yeah. yeah. He found us on his own. And um, you know, he emailed and called us, and he flew halfway around the world for the consult. Mm -hmm. um, he, he's a really neat guy. He's, you know, he, he literally goes in, in the bush. Um, and will set up his van and takes pictures of these beautiful lions and tigers. Um, and he had never been to Manhattan, so uh, you know he so, stayed. So he stayed in the city for a week. He caught mm -hmm. every Broadway show. Um, I taught him at the TKTS line. Mm -hmm. um, he has restaurant recommendations. But my point being is, you know, I, I think we've worked hard to hopefully cultivate yeah. um, a reputation where people will mm -hmm. come to us, and we're flattered. I mean, you know, I, you know, again, I. Yeah, as I hope you realize, I don't really have too much of an ego. Um, mm -hmm. And I told you, you have to call me John. We're on a first name basis in my <laughs> yeah. department, and that's yeah. by design. Um, but, you know, we provide a good service. Mm -hmm. We look at patients as part of our extended family. Um, my favorite part of being a doctor isn't necessarily giving the radiation. It's when I see them come back a month, a year, five years later, and we're kind of kibitzing about, you know, who got married, who's going to camp, who's, you know, what are the family events? And the cancer diagnosis becomes almost secondary mm -hmm. to the interaction with the patient on a human level. Yeah, because, again, you're, you're the doctor who trains other doctors, so it makes sense that patients would flock to you from all over the country, from different continents. Yeah, I mean, there's great doctors. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have colleagues all over the planet that I would let treat a family member of mine. I think mm -hmm. that's a litmus test. Um, would you let someone treat your mom or your dad? Um, and there's doctors in other cities that I think are superb. Uh, but yeah, we do take pride in the fact that we train a lot of them. And when was CyberKnife created and who invented it? So CyberKnife was invented in the 1990s uh, by a neurosurgeon who I'm friendly with named Dr. John Adler, who's a neurosurgeon at Stanford. Okay. Um, and he was visionary. He's a character. He's great. Um, so John recognized the benefit of what's called stereotactic radiation or very precise focused radiation. Mm -hmm. So the system that was around for decades is something called the Gamma Knife, which I'm also trained on. And Gamma Knife is essentially... You know, a squarish machine that has 201 cobalt sources, which are radioactive sources that all intersect at one point in space. Um, and you give a really high dose to that point. Okay. The problem with the gamma knife is that it's limited to kind of the upper spine in the brain. And the patient has to have a halo. You know, the screws put into the head to lock it into okay. place. Um, and John kind of came up with the idea, well, why does it need to be kind of this isolated point in space and why can't we give it intelligence? So what he did is he took a KUKA robot. So if you ever see the old Super Bowl commercials with the dancing robot yes. that, that put the paint the car, it's the same robot. It's an industrial robot. Mm -hmm. And he miniaturized a linear accelerator, which is the part of the machine that delivers the radiation. And he gave it intelligence. You know, he put a robotic brain into it. Um, so instead of having to lock the patient's head in, you make a soft mask, which is comfortable. And it was initially designed for brain tumors. Okay. Um, so that was what it was invented for initially. Um, but John said, well, you know, you, since we're no longer limited to the spine, you don't have to kind of have the patient's head into that kind of almost like a convection oven. Yes. Why can't you treat anywhere in the body? So there were physicians that, you know, there's a really fantastic doctor who unfortunately passed away, ironically, of cancer, Dr. Jay Friedland. Mm -hmm. um, and he had a prostate cancer training course for CyberKnife um, back um, in the early 2000s. So my former partner and I learned um, about CyberKnife from him. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of said, this makes sense for prostate. Um, why does it, you know, so that's how it kind of took off. And so, so, so you were kind of the first person to think, hmm, we were not we? We weren't the first person to, we didn't, I'm going to be honest, with you, we didn't invent CyberKnife for prostate, but we were kind mm -hmm. of the ones who took it to the next level, I think. Got we it. We were one of the okay. first ones to do it. We were among the first ones to publish on it. Um, and we by, have by far the largest experience on it. And and so to be clear, CyberKnife was originally invented by a neurosurgeon mm -hmm. for brain tumors. Correct. It can be used for a variety of other cancers. Correct. The first CyberKnife prostate cancer patient was treated in 2003, also in Stanford. Okay. Um, we started our program in 2005, two years afterwards. And as you correctly said, we are the largest CyberKnife prostate mm -hmm. practice in the country. And it can also treat, did I read, breast, brain, So lung. we wrote a protocol, or I wrote a protocol, which I'm really proud of. So historically, um, radiation for breast cancer took um, anywhere from four to six weeks, every day, Monday through Friday. Okay. Um, and 
it works beautifully. Um, but we designed a protocol in 2011, which I'm proud of. We know that we can do CyberKnife for prostate. The technology is the same. Why can't we do it for breast? So right. we did it through our IRB. And anytime you go on a protocol, you want to make sure IRB stands for Institutional Research Board. Um, so anytime you can't just do research. You know, you have to protect the patient, obviously, and you have to make sure that's a question that makes sense. So all major institutions have an IRB where you have to present your idea present the protocol that goes before a huge council of the senior doctors, and they have to say, yes, this is a question that's worth asking. Um, this is a treatment uh, that will be safe, we think, um, and it has the potential to benefit both these patients and on a societal level, all patients that you're going to do a better treatment. Um, so we wrote a protocol for five fractions cyber knife breast. Okay. Um, we treated our first patient in 2011. Um, we now have treated over 60 patients. Um, I presented the paper at the Radio Surgery Society meeting in San Diego in March, and it won the award as the best presentation. Um, so, and we're now um, involved in a research project with UT Southwestern in Dallas. Mm -hmm. We're looking at doing one fraction, you know, just one day. One you, day, You come yeah. in Monday, you leave Monday, and you're done. Um, and we just treated our first patient last Friday. Um, I called her this Monday, and she's doing fabulous. So, but we'll see. And also... Um Lung, lung tumors. So lung's been around. Pancreatic. For, yeah, yeah, lung, pancreas, spine. Yeah. Actually, one kidney, of the I, um, kidney yeah. we've done. Yeah. And one of the things as a radiation oncologist, historically, it's been very difficult to retreat patients. Meaning if you give patients okay. an area, let's say someone has lung cancer or a mm -hmm. spine tumor and you've already gotten regular radiation. Yes. Historically, it's been very difficult to retreat those patients. But CyberKnife gives us the ability to kind of go over and what other people can't fix, we can now re-irradiate it. So for many okay. years, I was getting referrals from other radiation oncologists to say, hey, this is a patient that I treated you know, yeah. seven years ago. The cancer came back. Can you help? And the answer is yes. And I consider that the ultimate you know, privilege when one of my peers says, hey, can you help me with yeah. the problem? And that's really kind of flattering. Right. Because CyberKnife can go back yeah. and make a sweep on a, an area that's already been Absolutely. that's already been radiated. Absolutely. You know, again, we're talking about prostate cancer specifically. So I want to sort of create a story because there are, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding out there. And I want to really start at the beginning. Where is the prostate gland and precisely what is its function? So the prostate sits um, above the penis, below the bladder. Okay. Um, right in front of the rectum. Um, so and I, I see you brought a little... I have yeah. a model, which the radio people unfortunately can't um, see, but the video viewers can. So this is the prostate right here. Okay. Um, this is the bladder. This is the urethra, the tube that drains the bladder, and the rectum would be where my finger is. Got it. So there's a lot of critical anatomy here. And one of my patients told me years ago, when I give a lecture, I have a picture of Grand Central Station. And you know, the patient said, you know, I think the prostate's like Grand Central. And I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, well, there's a lot that goes on in this tracks. There's people bustling, you know, meaning that it's a very compact Critical, area. Critical, yeah. Yes, and, and you're right. Uh, and to oversimplify what I do as a radiation oncologist is marksmanship. If I could give a mm -hmm. quadrillion units of radiation mm -hmm. to a tumor, I could cure every tumor. The problem is I would cause problems with the normal anatomy. Okay. So the way that we historically gave radiation um, was with something called IMRT or IGRT which stands for intensity modulated radiation or image guided radiation, which is you're treating a bigger area around the prostate because our regular machines are not intelligent. Okay. So as the prostate moves, which it will, those machines can't compensate. So you for the need that wide margin. Correct. So you don't yeah. miss. Mm. So you're mm. radiating more of the bladder, more of the rectum, and we do the radiation much slower. We do it over nine weeks. It works. CyberKnife is intelligent. So what we do is we put a little marker seed in called a fiducial. Um, it's a little gold seed. It takes me about 30 seconds to put it in. And as the prostate moves, which it will, the CyberKnife has two imagers that are built into the floor of the machine, which kind of function like eyes. So as the prostate's moving, the CyberKnife is tracking those movements in real time with an accuracy of less than a millimeter, which I tell patients is the diameter of a piece of hair. Yeah. So instead of doing a 15 to 20 millimeter margin like we do with other forms of radiation, we do a three to five millimeter margin. So we're radiating much less of the bladder, much less of the rectum, and we're now able to do the radiation faster. We do it in five days as opposed to nine weeks. But generally speaking, just not even specifically talking about radiation, in general, I would assume that because of the location of the prostate, any kind of treatment would leave the patient susceptible to a lot of side effects. Well, any doctor that tells you that there's a zero risk of side effects, run away from you know, they're kind of not telling you the truth. The side effects, right. Are, right. Yeah. So the side effects of radiation for prostate cancer 
are due to the anatomy that we just talked about. So the most common side effect of radiation is urinary frequency. Patients are going to okay. pee a little bit more frequently. Um, it gets better after about two or three weeks. Um, they're going to have a little bit of bowel urgency, like almost like a feeling that they have to have a bowel movement. That gets better after a couple of weeks. There's a very low risk of rectal and bladder bleeding. That's less than 5%. There's a very low risk of narrowing of the urethra. Um, okay, which, which would make it hard to urinate, right? right? So okay. sometimes the urologist will have to kind of dilate that up. That's unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, that happens in like 2% of patients, 3% of patients. Um, but it's a treatment that works beautifully, and the side effects are pretty minimal. Um, and patients do this as an outpatient. You know, they can, you know, some of our patients in Manhattan, you really come in on their lunch hour. You know, they come in for... Um, you know, an hour, and then they go back to work. But but generally speaking, again, not, not even to pinpoint radiation therapy of any kind, I think the reason men dread treatment of, si of prostate cancer is because they immediately equate any treatment, whether and there are uh, m very various forms of treatment, that they believe that they're going to get pr um, side effects because of the location, because what right. are you going to do, you know? And we try to minimize the fear. Um, yeah. And one of the things, you know, and, and the side effects are minimal, but yeah, the ones we talked about, urinary frequency, rectal urgency, um, well, those are the common ones, very low risk of, you know, oh. longer term side effects. What about, what about loss of, loss of erectile function? Yeah. So that's, you know, that's, that's the main one that men's ask. You okay. know, I'm, I'm a guy, I get it. Um, and if you look at the data for erectile dysfunction for cyber knife, it's about 25%, um, which is lower than really any other treatment mm. that's out there. And, and if you think about it, um, so prostate cancer is not a disease of 19-year-old college kids that can go three times a night. It's a mm -hmm. disease of men as they get into their 50s, their 60s, 70s, and lose some potency anyway. Mm -hmm. So half that number is felt to be attributable to treatment. The other half is felt to be attributable to age. Okay. Um, and we try to minimize their concerns. And one of the things that, you know, that we put together as a program is what I call my patient mentor program. Meaning, so as you said, I've treated a large number, or Seth and I have treated a large number Over of prostate. Over 5,000. Yeah, yeah. So what we've done, and a lot of patients know what it's like to sit in that seat when they're trying to decide between surgery, between cybernite, between prostate seeds, between IMRT protons, all the different things that are out there that we can chat about. Mm -hmm. um, but we have it stratified both by date of birth and when they finish. These are patients that want to pay it forward. Okay. They say, hey, I want to speak to these guys that are going through it so I can share my experience. Um, and so you know, you can find a patient that's around your age, because we have it by birth date, right. um, that either finished a short time ago or a long time ago, and they'll share their experience. And we'd like to think that they're happy, but you know, again, we don't tell them what to say. Um, they may say, oh gosh, that Hasi is a jerk, or they may hopefully they say he's the greatest thing on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, but whatever it is, you know, I'm not part of the conversation. So we let patients kind of chat. Now, it, does prostate cancer have overt symptoms? So l let's talk about first the guy who might not be going to the doctor on such a regular basis. What would clue a guy into thinking there might be something wrong? Is there any overt symptoms? It's to usually totally asymptomatic. Um, so it, so you know, 95% of the time it's picked up by a blood test called PSA, which stands for prostate-specific mm -hmm. antigen, mm -hmm. um, which I think is the greatest screening tool on the planet. And we can talk about the controversies associated with that. Um, so back in the day before PSA, to answer your question about symptoms, yeah. prostate cancer oftentimes did present symptoms You know, in the 1970s, 1980s, where there was no screening tool. So men would have, you know, advanced prostate cancer where they would have bleeding or pain for metastatic disease, meaning it spread. Um, but with the advent of the PSA, um, really, which you know, gained big hold in the 1990s, um, you know, we caught prostate cancer at a much earlier stage. So to answer your question now, it's usually asymptomatic, picked up by a PSA. Sometimes okay. by an astute clinician, usually the internist or the urologist that has a, you know, feels something abnormal on a digital rectal exam. Okay. But certainly if a man <clears throat> is not staying up on PSAs or has not begun to screen yet and is having, let's say, frequent urination or burning or painful ejaculation, that's that's a clue. That... Well, it's a clue that something's going on with the prostate. I mean, okay. you know, you know, common things are common. So you know, oftentimes patients have something called benign prostatic hypertrophy, which is just a big prostate. Okay. Um, you know, but again, the prostate, it's just plumbing. You know, as you get older, the prostate's swells a little bit so the urethra can narrow. Um, so patients, you know, may just go to the urologist with, you know, difficulty urinating. It may not be prostate cancer, um, but, you know, maybe they haven't had their PSA or maybe the urologist feels something on the rectal exam and that'll prompt the workup. Okay. Okay, good. All right. So, so I thought this was interesting because I, 
did some digging. And in the United States, prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in men, just behind lung cancer. One in one in one man in 41 will die of prostate cancer. And according to the American Cancer Society, they estimate that there are approximately 175,000 new cases of prostate cancer a year and still about 32,000 deaths. Mm -hmm. So with all of these advances, why, at least in the United States with all of these advances, why are men still dying of prostate cancer? It seems very straightforward to me. Well, it's interesting, though. If you look at the data, if you look at the mortality for prostate mm -hmm. cancer, so if you look at the 1990s as opposed to you know, 2019, the, the number of patients that you know, die per, per annum uh, for prostate cancer is about um, 20 men per 100,000 in a population. If you look in the 1990s, okay. um, it was more like 40. So the mortality rate has really dropped dramatically. Um, so 30, you know, 30,000 is a huge number. I think 30 is, is too much, you know, yeah. to be perfectly honest with yeah. you. But if you look at where we're now at compared to where we were, the mortality rates have decreased and no treatment for cancer is perfect. You know, unfortunately, your patients can develop metastatic disease where it spreads. Um, but we're doing better. Uh, or maybe they come to you too late. It can be, perhaps, absolutely. Or... They men haven't gone for screening and they're too late. Um, they've developed mm -hmm. metastatic disease from the get-go. You see guys with PSAs in the thousands, guys that come with bone metastases. Those guys, we can prolong things, but we mm -hmm. can't cure them. Um, so again, if you look at the mortality for prostate cancer, it's improving. So the message I'm hearing from you is stay up with your screenings. Stay because, up with your screening. Yeah. Um, you know, men should be screened. We can talk about guidelines, uh, but don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm a guy. I'm, I'm the worst patient. You know, men are notoriously bad patients. Well, doctors are notoriously We're bad the patients. We're, I'm yeah. The worst. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, so uh, you know, you have, go for your screening, um, follow with your internist. Um, when indicated, go to urologist um, and deal with it. And you, you said a moment ago that the single best way to screen for prostate cancer is the PSA. You mm -hmm. said that was prostate-specific an mm -hmm. antigen. Correct. What exactly does that measure? So PSA is a glycoprotein or an enzyme that's secreted by the prostate. Okay. Um, the purpose of PSA is to kind of liquefy the semen, to let the sperm uh, get to you know, kind of swim better. Okay. And also can break the cervical plug um, to get a woman pregnant. Um, but you know, so PSA is not specific for prostate cancer. It's specific for the prostate. Um, you know, the activity of the prostate. But as men get older, their PSA can rise. But if it rises above a certain level, then it becomes abnormal. And that prompts the workup, you know, biopsy imaging for, for screening for prostate cancer. And is it possible to have a normal PSA mm -hmm. yet have prostate cancer? Absolutely. So, um, so, you know, PSA is a test, but, you know, there's more advanced forms of PSA. So there's something okay. called a free PSA. So the normal, well, the historical normal was considered four. Um, again, you have to age adjust it up or down. Like a four for me at 52 would okay. be abnormal. Four for someone that's 80, you know, would be really low. So as, okay. you know, cause as you, cause your prostate gets bigger as you get older, so you make more PSA. If you have a bigger prostate, you're secreting more PSA, if that makes sense. Okay. So the free PSA. And it's totally normal for the enlargement to occur. Absolutely. That, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but the free PSA is a measurement. So let's say you had a PSA of four, which is considered normal, but your free PSA, the percent of free PSA was 10%. It should be about 25%. That's really worrisome. Let's say someone has a PSA of five and their free PSA is 30%. That's really not so worrisome. So to answer your question, you can have a normal PSA, okay. um, but yet be suspicious for prostate cancer. Or there's another PSA called the 4K score where they look at your PSA, but they can see, well, is that PSA put you at risk for prostate cancer based on subtleties or genomics within the PSA? Now, that said, if a man goes for a regular prostate cancer screening, is he? are there specific different types of prostate cancer screenings, am I understanding you to say, or is the result fractionated? Um, it depends who orders it. So, you know, if I see a patient, you know, I'll either order a 4K PSA or a PSA with a, with a free PSA attached to it. Um, it's usually the internist that's the kind of the gatekeeper. Um, okay, so, so what, what should men be, a 4K? So, so, so 4K? men should ask for a PSA, either a 4K okay, PSA. 4K or a PSA with a with a free PSA attached to it. Okay, with a free PSA mm -hmm. attached. Or a 4K PSA with a free, <coughs> free PSA attached. Correct. You can do, okay, so what all, optimal would be a 4K with a free PSA mm -hmm. attached. And the 4K reflexively does that. Okay, good. And that and that would that would indicate if you had a man with a normal PSA but there was still a problem brewing. Correct. Okay, cuz that yeah, that's scary if someone's just relying on PSA. Um, if, if a man has an elevated PSA, so he comes to you, first of all, what is, I, I don't know, like, so you said it's different. So PSA, it's different for a man 
40 to 50, 50 it's, to 60. Right, it's 60. age adjusted, but there's, there's ranges. You know, it'll, they, when, you, when you send the lab off, okay. you know, it'll say within this age, this is what's considered normal. Okay, so when you get, it'll say the reference range. Yep. If a man has an elevated PSA, generally speaking, what are the next steps he would take? So usually, as I said, it's usually the internist that'll order. You go to your regular doctor, your GP, mm. um, and they get your yearly PSA. Um, let's say it comes back five, they'll usually send it to the urologist. Um, so the urologist is actually usually the gatekeeper of the cancer. Meaning okay. that they, so they they will, you know, they'll make sure that is there something abnormal as a patient of a urinary tract infection because that can elevate a PSA. There's different okay. things that can elevate a PSA. You know, if you have sex a day or two before, that can elevate the PSA. If you ride a bike, you know, the pressure from the bike seat can okay. elevate your PSA. Um, make sure you don't have a urinary tract infection, as I just said. But let's assume all that's been ruled out. Um, so then, what a good urologist will do will either do a biopsy, or what some of the uh, more up to date urologists will do is they'll send the patient for an MRI scan. Um, if they're suspicious, because the MRI scan can look within the prostate to say, well, are there areas that we should target with the biopsy? You like that better than the bi- oh oh. So what you're saying you can, is you can do, you the, can do, the MRI would say well, you should biopsy this, this. area. Oh. Right, it's called a fusion biopsy. Okay. So again, if you're you know, again for all okay. the listeners that are out there, um, if you're being worked up for prostate cancer, and a good urologist will know that, ask if they're going to do a fusion biopsy. Okay, a fusion it, it's biopsy. It's better than your regular biopsy because what they'll do is they'll send you for an MRI scan, and then they give what's called a PIRAD score, and that's a level. It's from one to five, um, and it shows how suspicious the radiologist, the person reading the MRI scan, is of a cancer within a certain part of the prostate. So they may say there's a PIRADS-5 lesion at the left base, the upper part of the prostate, that should be targeted for biopsy. Right, because if they if they biopsy a different part of the prostate, they'll they get miss. kind of a false negative, right. correct? Right, what they usually do, you know, the generic biopsy will do you know 12 or 16 areas, so they'll catch okay. the majority of cancers. And what, when they do a fusion biopsy, they'll oftentimes do the regular biopsy and then target the area in addition to that. Okay, a fusion biopsy. Mm -hmm. Now, what what's the PSA debate about? Because I didn't even know there was a PSA debate. Huge debate. So, um, but then it, my, my director brought it up. He was like, "Ask about the PSA yeah, debate." I didn't so, even know. So, so the government has a group called the United Service Preventative uh, Health Service Task Force, mm -hmm. um, and it's a group that consists of. I'm laughing because there's not a urologist and there's not a radiation oncologist. It's uh, the group for prostate cancer was an obstetrician, a pediatrician, a nurse, and I'm not belittling the specialties, but they weren't in this specialty. Um, so they issued guidelines. Um, why do you think that was, Doc? Why were why were those specialties chosen to do this? Because that's what the task force was. Okay. You know, I, okay. Unfortunately, I don't have privy why they chose that. Okay. Um, and they misinterpreted, in my opinion, some of the data looking at screening. Um, so they argued, they recommended against screening for PSA, especially in men over a certain age. Um, and the internists um, took that to heart. So you mentioned that there was 170,000 cases diagnosed this year approximately, which is the correct number. Yeah. Um, about 10 years ago, there were way over 200,000 cases diagnosed. Okay. Um, those cases didn't go away. They're just not being screened. Um, so the controversy, a bunch of people, you know, like myself and urologists argued against the guidelines. So they updated yeah. the guidelines in 2018 to kind of say, yeah, we got it kind of wrong. So they kind of backtracked a little bit. Um, but but the debate hasn't caught up with it. In other words, the right, public hasn't. Right. And I'm publishing a paper. I'm presenting a paper at Astro this year in Chicago. We did a neat study at Winthrop. What we did is we looked at um, our patients that um, every week we present all our new patients. Um, it's called chart rounds. And all of my partners meet together. We present every new case. And again, you graciously said how young I am. I'm the old guy in my practice. But we, That's so uh, funny. You have old. a young practice though, yeah, right? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I feel yeah. old. <laughs> but um, so um, every week we present our new cases. We were seeing more higher grade, more aggressive prostate cancer patients. And I kind of thought about it. I said, well, maybe this is related to the guideline changes. Because, yeah. So mm -hmm. we looked, and Seth helped me with this, who you met. We looked at our patients pre-guideline and post-guidelines. And we stratify prostate cancer by low risk, intermediate mm -hmm. risk, and high risk. And we found a statistically significant increase in our practice before and after guidelines going from low risk to high risk. Yeah. And those patients aren't as curable. Um, there's much more cost to treating them because they may need hormones, they may need a combination of different types of radiation. Um, so I respectfully, I think the guidelines are crap. Um, well, and also know, because it's a blood test, we're not talking. I right. mean, it's so. Come on. And so the argument, so the reason why the guidelines were controversial is that what was happening is we were catching all these cases of prostate cancer, mm -hmm. and did we need to treat all of them? The answer is no. 
Um, so I accept the premise. You know, some people may be over treating prostate. prostate. Yeah. So the mm-hmm. question is, you know, the question is who should be screened. The question is who should be treated. Right. But if you put your head in the sand and say, well, we're not going to screen anyone, then we then, just don't know. Or yeah. no, what's going to happen is we're going to be back in the 70s and 80s, and we're going to be picking up all these mm-hmm. advanced prostate cancer patients that we can't. You know, that we can't treat. So, you know, again, it's... I agree with you, though. It's the question you're asking. Should we screen or should we just not over-treat? Correct. And that's, yeah. Right. The two separate questions. Yeah. So... And I agree with that 100%. I'm so, I'm so glad we brought that up because I didn't even know that there was a PSA debate. I, I had no idea. Yeah. Obviously, men must... The, but the specialists don't think there's... You know, we, you know, the urologists and the radiation oncologists are very firm that we, that we take patients should well, be screened. Well, what I wanted to ask was this, this team of people who said, let's not use the PSA or let's not use it so frequently or let's not use it at all... What do they suggest physicians do to screen? I don't understand what they're. So they've, as I said, they they relooked at their recommendations. So now okay. they're, you know, so now they're saying yes, patients should be screened, and they have again, it's a it's a two hour discussion as to as to their updated guidelines. Okay. Um, but they are more permissive in their screening, um, as far as the recommendations. Um, the interns, I think, are starting to catch up a little bit, um, because again, they're the gatekeepers. You know, you know, patients are going to the internist first. Okay, so it's not like they were saying don't use the PSA. Instead, they, rely on a digital exam. No, they were saying don't use the PSA, period. Just, okay. (laughs) Which is a mistake. Okay. Well, that's kind of like saying just stop doing mammograms and... Right. Which is a separate debate. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Now, is there a specific age at which you or your team recommends men should start? Because I would think, you know, I was thinking about this. I haven't heard anything. And I've got a lot of men in my life, brothers, cousins. Mm-hmm. For, for women, it's so clear cut. You start with your base, baseline mammogram at 40. Um, everyone's supposed to start with a baseline colonoscopy at 50. Those These are widely known right. so, recommendations. I've never heard anything. So you know, again, also controversial, but you know, my my opinion and you know, guidelines will support this. So if you, you know, so the general rule is 50, you know, age 50, you should have your first PS. Say. 50. Um, okay. you know, some of the new guidelines say maybe 55. Um, if you have strong, if you have you know a very strong family history, you know two family members, you should go down to 40. Um, for your first PSA, if you have one family member, 45. Um, African American okay. gentlemen are slightly more susceptible to prostate cancer; they should be screened to 45. Um, um, so again, it's a function of ethnicity, it's a function of risk factor, um, it's a function of age. Okay, so basically, it's it's between forty and fifty. Forty and it, fifty for for risk factors. Yeah. Everyone, in my opinion, at fifty um, should have their first. Okay. Um, some of you got AUA guidelines are now saying maybe fifty five. Again, I'm not quite on board with that. See, I'm surprised they don't say maybe forty five. No, so I'm, I think fifty. I think fifty is fair personally, um, for for your average risk patient. Or okay. Average, you know, average risk meaning no family members. Um, you know, that's what I would recommend. Okay, but if there's a family member, one or more, if or, you're African American, and okay. if you have multiple family members, go down to forty. Okay, and that's to get a baseline, and that's mm-hmm. because, and then once you start, it's done annually. So it should be done annually. Again, some of the newer guidelines say maybe every other year for the first one's normal. Um, so instead of every year, if you have a completely okay. normal PSA and you're fifty, you can probably go to every two years. Okay. All right. What do you think? I, I still you, what, like what every you, year. I mean, I, I think. It's, I mean, it's I, a blood test. I, I think. Blood, I think yeah. it's not a big deal to just you know, and and you know, if you go to a team that has a reputation for being judicious in who they treat, um, and I think we have that, um, then that's what I would recommend. And it is a blood test. It's right, not like exactly. a, it's not like a big yeah. Now I wanted to ask you about this because I, I was reading. Um, I think it was a Wall Street Journal article about genomic testing. Mm-hmm. What is genomic testing and how do you guys use it for prostate cancer? So genomics cancer? are great. So let's say, so you know, to take a half step back, the way that I look at prostate cancer, it's stratified by risk. Low risk, which means a Gleason, we can talk about Gleason score, but Gleason okay. score is what the pathologist looks at the microscope and a low PSA, intermediate risk. So, okay, so, so low Gleason score, low yeah, PSA. Yeah, let me take, can I take okay. a half step back and explain Gleason score? So when you yeah. do a biopsy, um, the pathologist will give a number, uh, a Gleason score, and it's okay. from six to 10. Okay. Um, so low risk and so low risk prostate cancer is both a Gleason score six and a PSA less than ten. Okay. Intermediate risk is either a Gleason score seven or a PSA. I'm sorry, is a Gleason score seven and a PSA between ten and twenty, or okay. between ten and twenty. And high risk is either a Gleason score above seven, so eight to ten. Okay. Or a PSA above twenty. Okay, so they take those two those, figures. And that you lower and you stratify the patient. Okay. So genomics are a way to look at the biopsy, and there's two main ones that are out there. One is called Oncotype and the other one's called Prolaris. 
Um, and what they do is they look at the genomics or the genes within that biopsy to say, well, is this, you know, is it more aggressive or less aggressive than they think it is? Uh, so I think genomics are great. I don't use it on everyone. What I think genomics are most helpful for, so let's say someone has a Gleason 6 and a low PSA, and you want to consider offering them something called active surveillance or mm -hmm. watching them. Mm -hmm. You send their genomics off, and if the genomics come back concordant, meaning that, yeah, this is low risk by Gleason score and PSA, and it's also low risk by their genomics, that's a great guy to watch. Yeah, you know, because you, you but let's say you have a guy that you think is low risk. Yeah. And you send off their genomics and well they're actually more intermediate or high risk. Then that that's a patient you may counsel that, yeah, you should probably think about treatment. Or let's say you have a person that's kind of low intermediate, at least in seven. And you say, Well, this guy, you know, maybe we can watch him. Yeah, you know, so you send the genomics mm -hmm. off and it comes back lower risk. That's a guy that you can discuss, you know, active surveillance with. Okay. So in answer to my th next question, which was going to be, are you in favor of genomic testing for all men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer? No, I'm hearing you say not for everyone. only th those who present gonna, as low. It, 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 well, to oversimplify it, if it's going to change my management, if I think it's going to change my management. If I have a guy that's a Gleason 8 and a PSA of 20, you're get, you're I'm going to treat him. Yeah. If I have a guy that's a Gleason 7 and a PSA of 12, I'm going to treat him. He's right. intermediate risk. Okay. If I have a guy that's a Gleason 6 and a PSA of 5 and I want to watch him, that's you want to confirm that, right. I'm gonna, okay. I'm going to send the genomics on. Do all doctors do that? Because I actually know a gentleman who's doing active active holistic surveillance. Do all physicians, is it pretty much standard operating practice before you determine that active holistic surveillance is appropriate, you do the genomic testing to confirm your- It should your, be. And I love the fact that you're talking about active holistic surveillance. And the reason why- You I, use that word in a video. Correct. Yeah. And so when we're proud of that program. So Dr. Aaron Katz, who's our chairman of urology, mm -hmm. is one of the finest urologists on the planet. And he developed that program. So active surveillance really just means you watch it. You kind of put your head in the sand, get a PSA every year and a biopsy every year. And okay. that's okay. Okay. Active holistic surveillance means that, you know, if you have a patient you're going to consider doing active surveillance on, we kind of take it to the next step. Diet change, lifestyle change, um, supplements when indicated. And those patients may never need treatment. And it's not just good for your prostate. It's, it's good, good for, for the body. Yeah, your heart your belly, your bones. Brain, um, and yeah. we, you know, we really take pride in that program. And again, it's not my program, it's Dr. Aaron Katz. Um, but we kind of just take, you know, and, and the patient takes ownership of it. You know, meaning that they're part of it. You know, you're going to give. And they're up. not just sitting around. No, you're going to yeah. give up the pastrami sandwich, okay. and you're going to have salmon. You're going to you know not have the white bread. If you want a bread, you're going to have you know whole grain or brown. You're going to cut all the sugar uh, out. You're yeah, going to not have yeah. the vegetable. You're going to have olive oil. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have a glass of red wine, which is great. But you're right? going to cut out all the sugar, like all the you're crazy gonna, you're, sugar. You're going right? yeah. to modify it. Yeah. You know, again, I'm a, you know, I'm a New Yorker. I like my pizza. You know, yeah. Like on occasion, maybe to have a steak. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, Aaron's opened my eyes to the holistic approach of healthcare, you know, and I, and I do think about it when I, and I encourage my patients to eat so, so, so to answer my question, there are physicians, not in your, on your team, but there are physicians who may be putting patients on active surveillance without first confirm, confirming their hunch with a genomic test. It may be, so so yeah, I mean, again, as, a, it, as a patient, you can advocate for yourself and ask- You should advocate for yourself and, and you should seek multiple opinions. Um, you know, if you, your prostate cancer is one of the interesting diseases that if you go to five different doctors, you're going to get five different recommendations and they're all right. right. Um, so I think it's beholden on the patient to do their homework, you know, research someone, you know, number one, you you go to your doctor, obviously who knows you, um, go to your urologist that did the biopsy and then you'll seek out, see someone that does a robotic prostatectomy, seek out someone that does cryotherapy, freezing the prostate. Yeah, we're going to Seek talk. out someone that does cyber knife. Seek out someone that does seed. See, you know, you should do your homework. Ask a lot of, and, and, and again, if a doctor says, we're going to put you on active surveillance, say, doc, did you do genomic testing to confirm that I'm a good I think candidate? It's, I think it's helpful. Okay. I think it's helpful. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And you even say, I mean, you're, you're very blunt in your in the videos. You have beautiful videos posted on Thank YouTube. You, um, you know, if, if you have a doctor that's kind of not offering you different options and not letting you take part in your own treatment, yeah. you say I mean, run. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard stories where patients yeah. see their doctor and they're booked for surgery that day. Um, and while it's not wrong to do surgery, you know, do Let's your Let's think about yeah, it. Yeah. You're well, take, you yeah. take ownership of your health. Now, if a man is diagnosed with prostate cancer, I want to discuss the various treatment options and the pros and the cons and the side effects. Because again, you, you're you very gracious on, on your videos. You say, look, I'm not saying that CyberKnife is the only way to go. Right. You should consider other options. Absolutely. So let's just educate people. Surgery. 
So again, I'm not a surgeon, but I do know what the so surgery, the surgery is something called a radical prostatectomy. Okay. Uh, and what they do is they take the prostate out again, if I can show you on the model. Yes, please. Um, what they, so this is the bladder, this is the prostate, this is the urethra. Yeah. So what they do is they kind of cut here where the bladder um, intersects with the prostate. Okay. They cut here. They kind of stent it with a catheter. They suture together. They dissect off the nerves and blood vessels on the prostate. Um, and it's a procedure that works beautifully. The more... You know, most of the urologists now will do something called a robotic prostatectomy as opposed to an open. Okay. Um, so they have what's called a Da Vinci robot um, where there are minimal incisions. Laparoscopically? Um, or? Uh, well, that's a, that's different. Okay. So that's kind of in between. But okay. I think if you're going to, I think, you know, most people do a robotic prostatectomy oh, now. Okay. So it's a Da Vinci robot. It has multiple arms and um, the field of magnification is beautiful. You can like see really beautifully. Um, and, you know, in a good robotic surgeon, you know, the surgery takes a couple hours. Um, they're out of the hospital in a few days. It's um, not open though. They go up through the rectum. No, oh. it's it's it, they go in through the belly. Okay, uh, but they're not big incisions. They're making smaller incisions. Got it. And they have what's called trocars, little arms that go through. <clears throat> and um, it's a procedure that works great. Um, so I, I, you know, I think you know. Again, I'll never talk a person out of surgery. Some people just mentally want to know that their prostate's you know in a garbage can somewhere. If that were the case, I would tell them to have surgery. What's the big con? Of surgery, you know, it's a real surgery. You know, again, it's it's a real surgical procedure. So there's always the risk of infection, the risk of anesthesia, um, the risk of blood loss. Um, you know, it's painful. What's the risk of impotence, though, if a man wants in a to... good in a good robotic surgeon's hands? I think it's comparable to a good radiation oncologist. You know, I think it's equal. Mm. Um, so again, I, I think, and there are some fantastic surgeons in the city at NYU Winthrop, NYU Langone. We have some of the finest surgeons, um, Anthony Corkin at Winthrop, Samir mm -hmm. Tanejo, Bill Wong, Jim Weissach, Herb Lepore at NYU, um, world-class surgeons. You know, we're fortunate to be in Manhattan and Long Island and have access mm -hmm. to some of the finest healthcare on the planet. But it is quite final. It's gone. The prostate is... Right. Yeah. You know, it's a real procedure. Um, but again, so, you know, the pros are it. It's, it's a one-day procedure. Um, you know, the cure rates are very high. Um, the cons are that it's a surgical procedure, so there's always the risk of surgery, but it works. Are side effects higher with surgery than other no, they're forms? Just, they're just different. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, you know, I think the... You know, I think the impotency rates, which we talked about, are comparable to good radiation. Um, okay. Surgery has a slightly higher risk of incontinence, which means leakage. Um, radiation has a slightly higher risk of retention or the urine getting stuck. Um, yeah, because of the narrowing. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the treatment works. Now, cryotherapy... I've heard you mention freezing the prostate. What so, is that? So Aaron Katz, who's our chairman of urology, is the president of the American Cryosurgical uh, Society. So cryotherapy is an outpatient procedure. Okay. Um, what they do, it's done under anesthesia. Um, they insert catheters into the perineum. That's the you know the flat area between mm. um, the testicles and the rear end. Mm -hmm. um, they put catheters into the prostate. They inject an argon gas, um, which forms ice balls in the prostate, and it freezes the prostate. Uh, patients go home that day. They usually go home with a catheter, um, but it's also a procedure that works. I, you know, to my and again, this is you know. Some of Dr. Katz's answer, when they when they freeze the whole prostate, it does have a higher risk of um, impotence um, compared to the other treatments out there. There is a higher with cry with full gland cryotherapy. What cryotherapy is beautiful for, okay. I think, um, in patients where it comes back after radiation, which is unlikely, but you know, again, no treatment's perfect. Cryotherapy is a very effective way to treat patients where you have to go back after radiation. Okay, so there's always the option if you have to go back after radiation. You could have it removed. You could, I mean, you could go back to any one of these. Right. It's difficult to okay. remove after, so, you know, so it's difficult mm -hmm. to remove after um, radiation because things scar down, but cryotherapy okay. works beautifully. Okay. But a higher risk of impotence. In my opinion, but yeah, that's a question to ask with cryotherapy, doctor. With cryotherapy. Okay. Um, hormones, you mentioned on one of the videos, you mean hormone blockers? Right. Or? So it's called androgen deprivation therapy. So prostate cancer is a disease that in the face of male hormones, it grows. So by going on hormones, which we do for our more advanced cases, mm -hmm. you kind of stop the cancer in its tracks. Okay. You make the cancer shrink and you'll make the size of the prostate shrink by about 30%. The problem with hormones, it's, it's male menopause hot flashes, loss of sex drive. Okay. Um, it's essentially chemical castration, um, loss of muscle tone. So we use it very judiciously. It, you said it's called androgen deprivation, deprivation therapy. therapy. Yeah, ADT. Does it, do, ADT, it does, so it does, it, it just blocks testosterone? Yeah, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, it lowers the testosterone. It's, just, it's assembly, you know, essentially, you know, back in the day before these drugs, men would have their testicles taken off um, for advanced yeah. or metastatic cancer. So, oh, so it's primarily used for? More advanced cases. Okay, because I, I actually have a friend, a friend of mine, his father, 
um, late 60s had the seeds implanted that we're going to talk about and had so, the ADT. So sometimes, and again, I used to be a proctor. I used to teach the seeds. Um, so okay. for prostate seeds, which I kind of moved away from, if you have a gland that's too large, okay. so temporary hormones, you know, three to six months will shrink the prostate by about 30%. 30%. Okay. So if the prostate's too large to do the seed implant, um, the prostate seeds, um, then you can put patients on hormones for three months and they'll shrink by about a third. Okay. And then that makes it more viable Easy to, to, do, do. to do the seeds. And again, the cons of this, you said it's like throwing a man into male menopause, men bone hormones. loss, yeah, men hate muscle hormones. loss. Yeah, we try not to do that and we can avoid it. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I've also heard that low testosterone correlates with depression. Right, patients you know, get moody. They're, you know, they're, I get it. if you're a vibrant workout guy, and all of a sudden, just imagine you took your strength away by twenty to thirty percent. Mm -hmm. You took your libido away, your sex drive away. Um, again, and I recommend it on patients that need it. You know, but we use it to really, save a life. Yeah, yeah, to use it judiciously when it's appropriate. You know, like when we use it, patients have advanced cancer. We need the hormones, um, and it works well, but it, it, you know, at a cost. Okay. And once those things like bone loss, muscle loss, depression, increased belly fat, loss of libido, all of that happens, those are irreversible, correct? It's difficult to reverse. So sometimes you know, sometimes with more advanced prostate cancer cases, we'll put them on it for two years um, with okay. the regular radiation. Um, when we take them off, it comes back, but it takes a long time. Um, and as men are a little bit older and they're starting at a lower testosterone anyway, Any, yeah. you're coming back from a lower point. <clears throat> Okay, now under radiation, so radiation is a, is a big section here we want to talk about. Before we start talking about the different kinds of radiation, yep. I, I would like you to explain how radiation works to kill cancer cells. So radiation works on the cellular level, you know, at the DNA. Um, so radiation prevents the cancer cells from dividing. So we have what's called photons. So photons are high energy particles that are emitted by machines called linear accelerators okay. um, that delivers the radiation. Okay. Um, the photons... Um, are targeted um, to the cancer cells, and they prevent the DNA from uh, dividing. Because uh, they damage the DNA? They damage the DNA. They also damage the regular cells too, but the advantage of radiation from prostate cancer um, is regular cells heal better um, than the cancer cells. So you get what's called um, repair of the cancer cells more so than the repair for the cancer cells. Wait, you get repair? Okay, so, so the radiation goes in and it damages the DNA of the cells thereby preventing them from, from dividing. dividing. So the cancer cells, cancer stopped in Correct. its tracks. Correct. But you're talking about the healthy tissue. Healthy that... cells see some radiation, but they're okay. able to repair themselves. Okay. So that's why we usually don't just give one treatment. Um, we'll give several treatments. You know, for CyberKnife, it's five. For the regular, it's right. 45. The regular cells, the bladder, the rectum can heal better than the cancer cells. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so so again, thereby by damaging the, the DNA, we're basically stopping the growth of the Correct. cancer. So we touched on it earlier before, but it's worth repeating. I IMRT, IGRT, a nine-week course of treatment. So that's it. And we have those machines that went there. We use it all the time. So image-guided radiation or intensity-modulated radiation, you know, we use it. We don't use CyberKnife for everyone because it's not for everyone. Let's say, God forbid, you have a patient with a head and neck cancer. We want to radiate the lymph nodes of the neck. Mm -hmm. We would never do do CyberKnife because it's too precise. We have both systems. Okay. Uh, but IMRT is many places that don't have what's called SBRT, the stereotactic body radiation or the CyberKnife that we use. Um, they'll use the IMRT machine to treat prostate cancer. It's not wrong to do it, um, but in my opinion, you know, to treat someone for 45 days as opposed to five days, I, I think you're not doing the patient a service. Um, and ASTRO, which is our governing body, and mm -hmm. NCCN guidelines, which is the government, essentially say that SBRT, which is what CyberKnife is, is now a standard of care for low and intermediate risk prostate cancer. And also, as you had said when we were discussing the model, would not would it not be true that IMRT and IGRT, which is the nine course nine week course of treatment also radiates a larger margin. So you're getting more healthy tissue. There's more damage to the bladder. In my it, opinion, yes. Okay. But again, the reason for using it, the, the pro of using it would be if it has spread. Well, you, I mean, so sometimes we have patients that have higher risk disease. Remember, we were talking about low risk, intermediate yeah. risk, and higher risk. Mm -hmm. Let's say someone has a Gleason 8 and a PSA of 20. Um, those patients, even, and you've done the workup, you really don't see anything outside of the prostate, but you know kind of statistically there's a risk that they may have microscopic disease in the lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. So for those patients, you know, personally we'll recommend a combination of both therapy. We'll do IMRT to treat the lymph nodes. Okay. And then we'll do a CyberKnife boost to treat the prostate. Okay. 
So we're taking the best of both. Okay. Um, seed implant we talked about. Yep. So seeds, I used to teach seeds. I love doing it. Um, it's a procedure that works. It's a one-day procedure. You go to the operating room. You put in anywhere from 30 to 100 radioactive seeds. It takes about an hour to do so. They must be tiny, tiny, yeah, tiny. Yeah, they're, they're you know, again, this is this is a fiducial mark for a cyber knife, but it's about mm-hmm. the same size. It's about the size of a grain of rice. Okay. Um, the problem, in my opinion, with the seeds is, number one, you're radioactive. So patients are radioactive for up to uh, six months. Um, two months for a higher dose. So for the first two months, you can't be around any pregnant women or any children under 18. Um, That's really something to consider. You know, if you're correct. a grandpa, like think yeah. about it. I have lots of patients that are teachers, that are bus drivers. Um, you know, you mm-hmm. can't be, for more than a minute or two, you can't be within six feet of the mm-hmm. patients. Um, but it works. Um, most people are moving away from seeds nowadays. Um, but again, it's a procedure that works. Um, I don't like doing it as much anymore. Well, the, the, the one big pro would be that it's a one day. Yeah, and you're giving a very precise dose of radiation to the prostate. Again, you're, you're again, seeds emit radiation to the prostate with a little bit of a margin also, but the lower doses are emitting outside of the patient. Okay, okay. And again, the con is it's a surgical procedure mm-hmm. and you're radioactive. Correct. All right, proton therapy as a form of radiation so therapy. So protons take advantage of something called the Bragg peak, B-R-A-G-G peak, which means theoretically the radiation is given a very narrow area in space. Okay. The problem with protons is that the prostate moves. When you breathe. When, when the Even breathe. when you're not breathing. There was a good study that was published out of UCLA. If you put the patient in a block of concrete, you know, they couldn't move, mm-hmm. the prostate's still going to move because you have air, you have water, you have gas, you have blood. Um, okay. So, And there were studies that showed the prostate can move for up to five millimeters in about 40% of the time and up to three millimeters in about 60% of the time. So if we're doing a three millimeter margin and the prostate moves, you're going to either move out of the radiation beam or there's going to be normal anatomy. Um, so the protons, you have to do something that keeps the prostate in that window, yeah. um, and there was a very good study. So oftentimes they'll put something in the rectum to push the prostate a balloon, up, against, right. right? To push the prostate up against the pubic symphysis. That's yeah. the hard bone behind the penis. The problem is that by pushing the balloon into the rectum, you're pushing the rectum into the dose. So there was a very elegant p- paper that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association um, several years ago uh, by Dr. Ronald Chen, C-H-E-N, out of the University of North Carolina. And he looked at the different treatments for prostate cancer and he had the, found that protons had the highest risk of GI complications. You can predict mm. that because for the reason that we just talked about. Because the rectum's getting... What protons are fantastic for, so let's say God forbid you have a child with a spine tumor, like a medulloblastoma. Mm-hmm. Um, the spine doesn't move. It's like a building. So it sits in that Bragg peak. Mm-hmm. Um, so protons are great for pediatric tumors. They're great for um, base of skull tumors where the skull doesn't move. In I my, get it. In my opinion, not quite as good for Not protons. for prostate cancer. I, I get not it. I get it. So it has its place, just not necessarily for prostate mm-hmm. cancer. You also mentioned True Beam. So True Beam um, is... Uh, is a gantry-based system uh, made by a company called Varian. We have um, one at Winthrop, but we're getting another one. Um, so TrueBeam, I think, is the best treatment for IGRT or IMRT, okay. um, the regular radius. The problem with TrueBeam and all other machines is that our regular machines are on something called a gantry. Can I borrow your pen for the other pen yeah, for one second? Sure. So um, if you imagine that my finger is the rectum and the pen is the beam, with TrueBeam or most machines, it arcs around like a record player. So when oh, it gets okay. to the rectum, it can move out of the way. It doesn't have that geometric ability. With a cyber knife, which we'll talk about a little bit more, has a shoulder, an elbow, a wrist, and finger. So it's going to mm-hmm. see the rectum. It's going to say, okay, I'm going to move my shoulder, bend my elbow, flex my wrist, and come in at a different angle. Got it. But when so it's want, almost like a record player. That's ex- the, yeah. The re- yeah, but, yeah. But TrueBeam's great for, you know, you're treating the lymph nodes, treating head and neck cancer. We use TrueBeam okay. all the time. Um, I'm not quite a fan um, personally, for TrueBeam for prostate cancer, uh, for for SBRT for high doses, but there are many fantastic clinicians um, that use TrueBeam. And again, on a bigger issue, so uh, you know the technology is great, um, but I think it's about the team, meaning that I can give the same scalpel to two different surgeons and different things are gonna happen. Mm. You can give the same cyber knife to two different teams for good or for bad and different things are gonna happen. You can give a TrueBeam machine to different doctors yeah. and different things are going to happen, both good and bad. So I don't think, you know, the technology is great, but I think on a global level, it's about the team. You know, who's the doctor? Who's the radiation oncologist? Who's the urologist? Who's the physicist? Um, you know, research the team um, because you can have, again, you can have an awful team on a cyber knife and you can have the world's best team on a true beam and you're probably going to get better outcomes on the true beam. 
Mm -hmm. right? Because you have a team that's really thoughtful, that really cares about what they're doing is meticulous. Because you said it's marksmanship. It's marksmanship, it's professionalism. And again, Mm -hmm. I think most doctors are professional. Most doctors work hard, um, but there's experience. It's like being an airline pilot. You know, 99% of the time, things are great. When the geese hit the engines, you want Sully. Yeah. Right? You want the the guy that's going to land the plane on the Hudson River as opposed Mm -hmm. to freaking out. I think we've seen a lot. You know, there's very little that really phases me, having done you know, thousands Five and thousands. Thousand, yeah. yeah, but you know, again, and every once in a while, if something comes up, like, whoa, we didn't see that before. But we can usually figure it out on the fly um, when we have to. Um, and someone that may not have done quite as many, you know, maybe wouldn't. Yeah. I get that. I get that. And again, continuing with radiation options, Gamma Knife you wanted to talk about. Gamma Knife is a system, you know, Cyber Knife was designed to kind of surpass the Gamma Knife. Um, so remember the, oh, so John okay. Adler, who invented the Cyber Knife, was Gamma Knife trained, as was I, and Gamma Knife was designed for brain tumors. So you can't use Gamma Knife on anything really other than the brain and spine. Oh, okay. Okay. And so that was sort of the predecessor to the Cyber Knife. Yep. And now we come to Cyber Knife. And again, the big, big plug for this is it's five days or less. Um, so, so again, the, the big, the benefit of CyberKnife, and you know, so you know, I always tell my patients that you know, don't do the treatment for the five days, you know, because five years from now, you're not going to care whether you did the treatment in five days or nine. Or forty-five, weeks. yeah. Right. The better reason to do it, in my opinion, is that you're giving a better dose of radiation to the cancer and less radiation to the normal anatomy. The five days is just the icing on the cake. Um, CyberKnife, um, and what CyberKnife is, and we talked about this briefly, but to go in in more depth, it's a regular radiation machine or a, or a linear accelerator that's been miniaturized and placed on a robotic arm, and it's intelligent. And CyberKnife is the only system that there that's out there that can both track and correct for the movement of the prostate in real time. So TrueBeam, which we talked about, you can put a marker in. So the way that CyberKnife and and TrueBeam works, Mm -hmm. and there's some doctors that are out there that are using TrueBeam without a marker, which I think is completely wrong. Um, But what what happens is you put a marker into the prostate um, and both the CyberKnife and the TrueBeam can image the marker. They can take a picture of it. So let's do TrueBeam first. So let's say you have your marker for TrueBeam. You do a match on the fiducial. That's what the marker's called. Mm -hmm. And let's say the marker's off a little bit, you know, five millimeters, seven millimeters. So with the TrueBeam, you can reposition the patient and put the marker in the right place. The problem with the TrueBeam is that as the beam is arcing around you for that two to five minutes, you can't compensate for that movement. So that's why when you use TrueBeam for the IMRT, you're doing a bigger margin. Some people are using TrueBeam for SBRT and they're trying to do a really rapid treatment. And you know, again, in a good team, that may work if you're really fast about it. But it's a bigger margin. Or you're doing a smaller margin and hoping that the prostate doesn't okay. move. The CyberKnife is the only system that's out there that can both compensate and correct. We go a little bit slower on purpose. The treatment will be 20 to 23 minutes. Um, and we don't care if the prostate moves. We want the prostate to move because we want to catch it in its natural position. And then uh, we'll compensate and correct for it. Right. And I want to I, I want to go very <coughs> deeply into the cyber knife. But before we do, I just want to mention because you would you mentioned this on one of the videos. And I thought this was very important to to let people know that in the unlikely event that radiation therapy, including CyberKnife, doesn't work, right. there are other options for sure. treatment that a patient has, right, versus if you start with surgery. Well, let's do surgery first. So uh, if you have surgery, um, let's say you're your lower intermediate risk prostate cancer patient, your chance okay. of being cured with surgery forever are going to be about 90 to 93 percent. Okay. So patients ask, well, if you have surgery, how can it come back? Right? That's what I would want to know. So, yeah. you know, again, this is the prostate. They take the prostate out. This is called the prostate bed, where the prostate used to be. Okay. So if even one cell is left behind, one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, so on. And they okay. have what's called a rising PSA after prostatectomy, which means that the PSA is coming back. So if that happens, you And get, that would indicate that cancer is returning, yes? Yes, usually in the prostate. Okay. So if that happens, you get one option before hormones. You can have regular radiation. You can't have CyberKnife because your prostate's in a garbage can somewhere. Oh, regular radiation yeah. will work about half the time. If that doesn't work, you go on hormones. If it comes back after CyberKnife or any radiation treatment for that matter, it's difficult but not not impossible to do surgery, but it is a more difficult surgery because things scar down. Mm-hmm. However, you can have cryotherapy, which is freezing the prostate. Mm-hmm. That will cure two-thirds of those patients that fail radiation. If that doesn't work, which is unlikely, cryotherapy can be done a second time. But you can do cryotherapy more after th- surgical removal of the... No, you can do it after radiation. Oh. 
Okay. So now we're looking at radiation. Okay. You know, so 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 with surgery, you really get one good option: regular radiation, and that'll oh. work about half the time. And then if that doesn't work, you got to go. You got to do the hormone on hormones or on protocol somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, with CyberKnife or any radiation, if it comes back, you know, ten percent of the time it can come back. Um, cryotherapy is an option. Okay. Right. And cryotherapy can be done a second time. Hi, ultrasound. There's, so my point being is that there are more options in the unlikely event that cyber knife doesn't work than the unlikely event that surgery. There are doesn't other work. options that you yep. can go to. Yep. All right. And which treatment options of these that we just discussed does NYU Winthrop offer? We offer all of them. Um, okay. So that's okay. the nice thing about it. Uh, and again, and and we're known for our cyber knife program. But I think what we take pride in, and this is Joe. You know, Kudos to Dr. Katz, who's my, you know, the chairman of urology. You know, when Aaron came on, you know, I helped recruit him. Um, That's about, Dr. Katz, yeah. Yeah, about Aaron Katz, about eight or nine years ago. And, you know, he's the chairman of urology. And we made a conscious effort to really change the way that prostate cancer is treated. So a lot of places have a bunker mentality. So if you go to the surgeon's office, you'll have surgery, and, and they won't really send you out. You go to the radiation doc, you'll have radiation. Mm-hmm. Um, we believe in a three-person team, the surgeon, the radiation oncologist, and the patient as an okay. equal member of the team. Um, so every patient that I see is seen by a urologist. Um, the patients that Dr. Katz are seen by a radiation oncologist. And we don't force a patient to have a treatment. We explain the pros and cons. We come up with the best treatment for that individualized patient. Um, so, so let me understand you correctly. If, if a patient comes to you first as a prostate cancer patient... I'll send to you, Dr. Katz. Yeah, you bring in Dr. Katz, who's a urologist. If the patient starts with Dr. Katz he'll and comes sent- to him first, he'll say, let's bring in Dr. Dr. Well, you see, we're not... You know, we may, we, you know, I may be you know, two blocks away. Uh-huh. You know, our offices aren't physically oftentimes in the same building. Mm-hmm. Um, but he'll say, before we make a final decision, meet with Dr. Haas. Got or, it. Or I'll say, before you make, you make meet with Dr. Katz or, 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 or other fantastic urologists. You know, we have now access to the world's finest urologists in NYU Langone. I've worked very closely with Jim Weissock, Samir Tanaja, mm-hmm. these great guys in, in Manhattan. I'll say, you'll know, talk to Samir Tanaja about a prostatectomy. Talk to Herb Lepore about a, a surgeon. Pro- yeah. yeah. See, you know, see from the best of the best. So it's multidisciplinary. Absolutely. And that's important. So yeah, that's why you've heard me talk about, you know, if someone's forcing you into a treatment, run away from them. You know, you know, I'm comfortable enough with my treatment yeah. um, that I want patients to see other treatments. Yeah. I only want to, it doesn't do me any good if a patient's not comfortable being treated by me. I want them to have come in with their eyes wide open that they've seen surgery, they've seen cryotherapy, they've seen seeds. Yeah. Um, and they say, you know, this guy Haas, you know, is really kind of, I think, doing a good job. Um, you know, I, I've spoken to his patients, I've read what he's written. Um, and I want them to make, I've met with his urologist, and I think this is the right treatment for me. Okay, and and all over the country, so that's not a standard practice to not have everywhere. a patient. No, a lot of places, you know, you get this bunker mentality, you know, where they're going to the surgeon and they're booked for surgery, as we chatted about before. Before they leave, they're booked for surgery. Mm-hmm. I don't like that. I like your approach. Yeah, I like that because it does it does include the patient as part of it should. the yeah yeah it should yeah the days are over where you just do what the doctor says right. if, you've got to come in as an informed patient absolutely be your own advocate yeah. now now who so what. Who's a good candidate for cyber knife treatment? For prostate? For, for prostate, Yeah, yes. so, so the best candidates, um, and you've heard me say it, if you're really, if you're a candidate for surgery, you're a candidate for cyber knife. And what that means in English, okay. um, if you have lower intermediate risk disease, so it's confined to the prostate, you have a lower intermediate Gleason score, your staging is negative, meaning there's no evidence of lymph node metastasis, there's no spread beyond the prostate. Okay. Um, the same patients that would go for surgery are the perfect patients for cyber knife. Okay, so... It has to be confined to the prostate. If it is metastasized at all, you cannot do cybernetic? Well, you can. The question is, should you do it? And again, this is a whole separate topic. So it used to be patients with metastatic disease were treated with hormonal therapy alone. But in the last year or two, Mm -hmm. there have been new studies for prostate cancer. In particular, patients that have what's called oligometastatic disease or low-volume metastatic disease, typically you know, less than five sites. Okay. Um, there's data showing that if patients have SBRT, you know, the high doses of the stereotype mm-hmm. radiation, there's a survival benefit in terms of doing the SBRT in conjunction with the hormone. So again, we're kind of reinventing or rethinking, um, you know, is CyberKnife for patients with metastatic disease? It's still evolving, um, but the classic teaching is patients that have organ-confined earlier stage disease are the perfect patients. Okay, and, and at what point is a man cancer so advanced that he does not qualify for CyberKnife when it moves beyond the prostate? Right, but sometimes it moves into the lymph nodes. Um, those patients, as we talked about earlier, will have the combined therapy, meaning the IGR2 or the true beam in our institution for the, the lymph, lymph nodes, and then we'll do CyberKnife to the prostate. Okay. 
Okay, so, so there, is, there is still some variability. It's mm-hmm. not just early stage, early, early right. stage. Right, and, and again, that's why I think it's beholden to go to a center that has access to all the different technologies and all the different experts. Okay, and again, we said this before, the CyberKnife is intelligent. It was it was so interesting because I was re- doing all the reading uh, about this, and it talks about you, I, cruise I, I get, missile. And I can't tell you, I'm just, your kudos to you. I mean, you know, you've really done your homework. I mean, I love talking to the, I love having the high-level discussion. Um, we, this was fascinating to me. This was really fascinating stuff because it's gotten so advanced. Yeah. The, 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 what is it? Missile cruise technology? Well, I mean, the... you know, it's, I, I don't love that term, to be honest with you. That, that's from, you know, what it is, is, you know, it's 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 the precision of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I'm not a big fan, honestly, and I've seen it written on our website of the cliche terms. What I like is the precision. You know, it's, it's intelligent. It's yeah. precise. Um, you know, it's a treatment that kind of really kind of markets itself. You know, it, it, you have an intelligent robotic treatment. Your margins, meaning the area of normal tissue is less than a millimeter. You know, it just makes sense. You know, it, you, if you can give really high doses of radiation, yeah, you can limit... Yeah, because it's so confined. Right, yeah. exactly. And, and if I said to you, how is the cyber knife technically superior to other forms of radiation, would it be primarily because it is, in fact, so precise? So there's several advantages to it. Um, number one, it's the intelligence. Um, it's the only system out there that can both track and correct, meaning meaning that mm-hmm. it tracks the movement, but you know, other systems can track it and say, well, we can't correct for it, so we have to turn the machine off and reposition the patient. That's what TrueBeam has to do. Mm-hmm. Um, the CyberKnife can track and correct without changing the beam. Um, and the other advantage is the arm. Remember, we talked about the record player of the gantry. It has a shoulder and elbow. A wrist and, and fingers. It's yeah. coming in at a hundred different angles. You yeah. know, so you know, historically, radiation and most radiation is given on the gantry. CyberKnife is And again, is the, the gantry is just a circle like a right. record player. And okay. CyberKnife is the only system that's out there that has the arm. And yeah, in the literature, did I did I misread this? It said that, for instance, if the patient, you know, as the patient moves, if it gets mis misaligned, the the system just doesn't deliver radiation. Yeah, it repositions the patient. The couch will reposition and yeah. move the patient. Now, walk me through the step. A gentleman comes to you for cyber knife treatment. What are the steps? A pa- take me through this so have, process. Yeah, so you know, so I see about. 20 to 25 new patients a week. Or, or uh, Dr. Or Dr. Blacksburg, right? Seth, right. So, yes. Seth, you know, so let's say you come into Manhattan and you see Seth, and Seth is one of the finest doctors you're ever going to meet. Um, so let's say Seth is a consult today. Okay. A um, guy that has intermediate risk prostate cancer he's going to treat. He's going to send the patient to the urologist. Um, or if the patient's okay. referred by the urologist, he'll discuss it with the urologist, and getting back to that multidisciplinary okay. um, approach. Um, after that's done, Dr. Blacksburg will bring the patient in for the fiducial markers. Um, that's like a five minute procedure. That's how the CyberKnife can be so precise. It's like a much, much easier version of the biopsy. And, and again, just to clarify for people, the fiducial markers, as I read, there are four of them implanted, two at the top, two at the bottom. Correct. They're very tiny. About the size of a grain of rice. How, how are they implanted? I did five yesterday and Seth's done a bunch this week. What we do is we numb up the skin of your perineum. That's okay. the flat skin between the testicles and the rear end. We numb up the rectum. We put an ultrasound probe in. We can see the prostate beautifully. And then it's two tiny needle sticks. The reason why it's two sticks as opposed to four is each needle has two markers in it. We take it out and they go home two minutes afterwards. It's an outpatient procedure, no anesthesia. Local and, local anesthesia. Right. We yeah, use lidocaine yeah. okay. to numb up the skin, lidocaine to numb up the rectum. Um, if patients want something for pain, we can give it. 99% of our patients don't ask for it because um, they don't need it. And actually, I asked Seth, I, I, just, I just asked him, I said, do, do, do men complain about pain? And he said, on a scale of one to 10, most men honestly will say a two, three. Yeah, and they say it's Just, much easier than the biopsy. Uh, okay. So a week after the fiducial markers, we get a CAT scan and an MRI scan with the markers in place. The reason we do okay. that is we take the best images of the CAT scan, okay. the best images of the MRI scan, we fuse them on a computer. Okay. There's in a couple of weeks for us to do our planning. Um, you then start on a Monday, you finish on a Friday. It's only five days consecutive, all outpatient. Um, treatment takes about 20 minutes, but you'll be in the department for about 40 minutes to an hour because one of the things that we do first is we give a special medicine called amifostine to protect mm-hmm. the rectum. Amifostine is a liquid that was designed by the military um, to protect against radiation. Since we have access to it, we give it to every patient prior to treatment. We uh, think that's one of the reasons we've had a very low risk of side effects. Low risk of gastrointestinal, rectal, yeah. Rectal, yeah. 
And and so again, the fiducial markers they're implanted. Are they removed after? No, nope, they're made of gold, so they stay in the patient. I always joke with my patients, "You're worth about another five hundred dollars." After about, we're all said and done. And they don't set off anything at the at the airport. I get asked that question all the time. No, no. What I thought was, I thought this was. Well, let me ask you about one thing. Question about frequency. Um, is it always five consecutive days? Is there any occasion where? So maybe some people they... do. Some people do every other day. Um, okay. You know, Seth does every other day. I do every day. It's just stylistic. Okay. Um, I've always done. Uh, I've always done five days in a row. Some studies say, well, you know, some, maybe you want to look at doing it every other day. It's really, that's kind of the art of it. Um, okay. So it depends. I've always done five days. I think it's more convenient for the patient. And it's about 20 to 30 minutes? Yeah, the, the treatment the time on average with the new cyber knives that we have, treatment takes about 20 minutes. Um, but with the amifosti, it takes about 40 minutes. One of the things that we also offer sometimes patients, instead of amifosti, is something called Spaceor. And Spaceor is a, a gel that we can put between the prostate and the rectum to create space to move the rectum out of the way. So that's Almost like the balloon. Uh, well, the balloon, no, the balloon does the exact opposite. The balloon pushes the rectum into the dose. Okay. That's what you don't want to do. But it's designed for protons to keep the prostate still. Spaceor creates space and moves the rectum out of the way. How is that administered? It's done at the same time as the fiducials. Oh. It's an extra needle stick where we kind of okay. dissect the needle into the plane or the area between the prostate and the rectum. We put a little saline in just to kind of create that space and then inject the spacer. We offer both. Yeah, I, think, and, I think they both work. And, and after treatment, is that? No, it dissolves. It, okay. After about three months. Understood. And uh, what I thought was interesting, um, the mold that they make, we, w- we went into, yeah, you saw it. We, we worked with, I, I don't remember you the, the, the technicians. Well, and it, Andwelli didn't do it. It was a, it was a female technician. She, um, she, she did the mold with, with the patient Perry. that we brought in. And, and it was fascinating be, and how they, they make this mold. Yep. And for the purpose, again, of keeping the patient still. Right. So, so even though the Cybernet can correct for movement, which it does, it helps if the patients are you know, more re- you know, laying flat in the same position every day. Yeah, and that's what the mold, the mold does. And then what what I thought was interesting, I noticed behind the cyber knife you machine, there were all the molds. Yeah, yeah, all the molds were yeah, hanging that week, for that week's patients. Yeah. Now, what side effects can a man expect following cyber knife? Because th- this, my impression is that this has the lowest side effects of any treatment. So the side effects that the men will get. Um, so I always bring patients back for follow up at three weeks. The reason why I do that is the first week after treatment, the side effects peak, meaning the urinary frequency and the rectal urgency. Okay. Second week, they level off. Third week, they get better rather than worse. So by the time I see my patients back in three weeks, side effects may not be completely gone, but they should be getting better. And it's just rectal urgency. And urinary frequency. And that's it. And then it gets better after about three weeks. And I I just have to ask this because I know people are thinking, what is the percentage on... um, Impotence. Twenty five percent with CyberKnife, you know. But again, getting back to that number, you know, it's forty percent with the other forms of radiation. But let's let's kind of okay. delve into that a little bit more. Um, so again, so prostate cancer, you know, and the twenty five percent definition of is ability to have penetration at five years. Um, if you look at the data for erectile dysfunction, so again, we talked about this earlier. Mm-hmm. Prostate cancer is not a disease of college kids. You know, it's a mm-hmm. disease of men as they get older. 50s, 60s, 70s. So half that number of the 25% is attributable to age. So if you looked at okay. 100 men that were 70, probably 20% of them would have erectile dysfunction. Anyway. Correct. So the number is what it is, mm-hmm. but you know it's not from the treatment necessarily. It's from the fact that you're a little bit older. Does that make sense? Yeah, but but what if a man is fine prior to treatment and come, right. comes right? So, I mean, so again, so you know, again, I still give the twenty five percent number, but you know mm-hmm. those patients are going to be on the on the better end of it, you know, because you know, most likely those patients would have potency would be good anyway. And I thought it was interesting. I did not know this, but um, Anne, the lovely PR woman who handled this whole situation, she told me, and I, I read it in the American Cancer Society t- statistics, that really the age range is 40 to 80. The the risk range is 40 depending, to 80. Depending on risk factors like we talked yeah. about. I mean, I don't think a 40-year-old man of average risk should be screened. But I think a 40-year-old man whose dad had prostate cancer, his older brother had prostate cancer, should absolutely be screened. How, how, what's the youngest patient you've ever treated? I'm just curious. 40 or 41. And I treated, oh, his, wife, and he treated his wife for another cancer. I, mean, yeah, I never named him. There's a 41-year-old guy. And his wife had a, different, had, had a GI cancer. I treated them both. That's young. Yeah. But he did great. You know, the nice thing about prostate cancer, patients do fabulous. And he did CyberKnife. Mm-hmm. 
Um, how do you measure the success of treatment with CyberKnife? PSA. So, um, so we same thing with surgery. By the way, we track PSA. Okay. Um, so the definition. So with surgery, your PSA should be zero because your prostate's out. Okay. Um, with other treatments, radiation, you know, CyberKnife, you know, you're going to always have some PSA because as we spoke about, PSA is not specific for prostate cancer. It's specific for the prostate. Okay. Right. So you're gonna if your prostate's still in you with CyberKnife or Cryo or IMRT or protons, you're going to have PSA. So the definition of when it does not work, and it's not my definition, it's ASTRA, which is our governing body. It's called the Phoenix definition, like Phoenix, Arizona. You can mm -hmm. Google it. It's when you see a rise of PSA that's two full points above its lowest value after a year and a half. The reason why I put that year and a half caveat in mm -hmm. is that it's been very well reported on and published on, including by us and me at Winthrop, is that you get something called a benign PSA rise where the PSA drops starts to rise again out to a year and a half and then falls. Um, it, it, and it's thought to be something called apoptosis, which in English means that a bunch of the normal mm -hmm. prostate dies off later. Okay, so basically your <coughs> measure of success is watching the PSA. Right, any measure of okay. success for prostate cancer is monitoring the PSA. And does CyberKnife have the highest success rate of any available treatment option? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's you know, again, we can talk about that. So there's no treat. I mean, all treatments for prostate cancer work beautifully. Um, you're not going to find a, a treatment that has a higher PSA success rate than CyberKnife. There's many that are comparable, okay. Uh, okay. but none that are better. Okay, that's fantastic. But, you know, CyberKnife technology is so advanced, and you said it's been around since... The 90s. Oh, it's been around since the 90s. Just as a scientist, where do you see this going? Because I... I, we've we talked on the air. I also read about this mm -hmm. that you know now they're looking at treating CyberKnife breast cancer cyber, with CyberKnife in one day. Like where are we going with this? Yeah, What's, I mean, so so for yeah. prostate cancer specifically. Right. So you know, for prostate cancer, I mean, some people have looked at doing one fraction prostate. Um, I moderated a session um, at the Radio Surgery Society a few years mm -hmm. back um, where the debate was one versus five. Um, so five, so one is not close to being standard of care, but there's a radiation oncologist in Portugal who's looking at doing one fraction prostate. In his hands, it works. Um, the data hasn't really shown one fraction to be as good as five fraction, at least not yet. Um, so I think the, to answer your question, I think where we're going to do better um, with radiation is faster treatment times. Um, we have something called an MLC where the you know where the the, the leaves on the cyber knife are moving much faster, more rapidly. Um, okay. So the technology is getting better. Um, you are now looking at integrating you know maybe with some of the newer immunotherapies, you know the targeted therapies, integrating that with treatment. Um, we're looking to open up a protocol at NYU Winthrop in conjunction with David Wise, who's one of the medical oncologists at Langone, mm -hmm. NYU Langone, with using a novel. Um, anti-hormone medicine that doesn't have quite the same side effects for our more advanced cases. Uh, so it doesn't have side effects of the A... The, yeah, the, right, the ADT. Yeah. So, it's so, um, so we're excited. I mean, one of the nice things about you know, being a part of the NYU Langone, NYU Winthrop system is that we have access to some of the most exciting protocols that are out there. Um, you know, I leave you know, some of these meetings and I'm electric you know, with what's out yeah, there. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's really cool. I mean, and, and you know, again, NYU Winthrop the greatest place to work, but we were a smaller institution now that we're part of the larger... And why you let go. Yeah, the Perlmutter yeah. Cancer Center. I mean, you know, we have access to these protocols, which are mind-boggling. Um, you know, when I was doing the radio show on Sunday that I told you I host sometime, you know, I had David Weiss as my guest, and we were talking about the new protocols that are open, and it is, it's astounding. And what are, are right now, are they in, they're being studied? They're being, they're they're being, being rolled out okay. yeah, as we speak. So, you know, again, ask, you know, again... For the patient to be an advocate, ask what protocols are open. You ask what's new that's out there, and it's exciting. And you, and you see you see the stats for prostate cancer getting better and better as we better. go. Yeah, I think. Well, it's interesting. I think you know. I think hopefully, as the screening recommendations kind of correct. Yes. Um, we'll see that mistake go away. Um, plus the advent of new technology, new protocols. So I, it's an exciting time to be a radiation oncologist. You know, I I always joke that you know if I won the Mega Millions tomorrow. You'd and still I, go to work. I yeah. love what I do. I mean, I might work differently. I don't know if I'm going to work 100 hours a week. Mm -hmm. But um, at the end of the day, I love being a radiation college. And what I love best about it, you know, you kind of hit the nail on the head with our city practice and many old too. You know, we run it like a family. You know, my favorite thing about being a radiation oncologist isn't the nuts and bolts of delivering the radiation. My favorite thing is seeing a patient that's five years out from treatment and he tells me that his granddaughter got married or his son got accepted to an Ivy League school. Mm -hmm. um, that's really cool because you're not talking about the cancer. 
You know, yeah. you, you've moved, you've evolved beyond that. Um, and you kind of take these patients into your family and they take them into yours. Um, you know, I figured it out the other day. I've treated over 21,000 patients myself in the 22. In the 22 years. Yeah. yeah. Well, if, if you think about it, you know, I see 20 something consults a week, figure 22 years times 48 weeks a year on average. You have a couple of weeks here and there where I'm either traveling or on vacation. It's 21,000 patients. Mm-hmm. Um, and multiply that. Each patient has, on average, you know, four family members. Um, so I would You're say affecting a lot of people, and it's really yeah. nice. Like I go out with my family. You know, we'll go out for dinner or we'll go somewhere. I'd say probably twenty percent of the time, you know, I'll see someone that you know I treated them or mm-hmm. their uncle or their father or their niece or their mom. Yeah, and it's really kind of nice. And they come over and they say, you know, you treated you know, we're all, and it's a nice way to make a living. You know, I, I love what I do. This has been fantastic. I feel, <coughs> I feel very positive about the, the progress that's been made, at least in prostate cancer, after right. doing this, after doing the research for this show. This has been fantastic. Well, yeah. you've done, I mean, again, I, I'm so thankful that you asked me to be on the show. And, and I really like, you know, again, I meet with lots of different people. And you've been off the charts. I mean, you, you, oh. you, you're super prepared with the best questions. You know, this to me has been a, a joy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I wish I could keep you forever, but you guys, that's all for today's show. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Jonathan Haas. If you want more information about Dr. Haas, NYU Winthrop Hospital, or CyberKnife, just visit nyuwinthrop.org. That's nyuwinthrop.org. You can also call 1-866-WINTHROP. Dr. Haas, thank you so much. Henry, thank you so thank much you. for having me on. This was a great, uh, great evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>